Government Product News is here today with acoustics expert Nicholas Moeller, who is vice president of KR Moeller Associates Limited. His company is a developer and manufacturer of the Logison Acoustic Network sound masking system. Uh, greetings, Nicholas Moeller. Uh, can you tell us about your company and its work? Yeah, what our company does is it uh, develops a technology known as electronic sound masking. Uh, and these systems aren't generally uh, widely known, let's say, in the lay market, uh, but have been around for about 45 years. Uh, and basically what you're looking at is a system of electronics and loudspeakers, uh, which are installed in the ceiling space of uh, office spaces and other similar indoor sort of working environments. And what these systems do is they uh, generate uh, and uh, adjust an electronic background sound, uh, whose purpose is to uh, improve the acoustical performance of the space. So uh, by raising the ambient sound level, you cover up a lot of the uh, unwanted noises in that environment, uh, with the primary benefits being uh, to uh, improve productivity by reducing distractions, uh, increasing speech privacy, and uh, reducing uh, noise levels. Excellent. Uh, Nicholas Moeller, does it make sense to use sound masking in government buildings? Does it help achieve speech privacy and noise control? Absolutely. And in fact, it makes sense to use it as part of the acoustical design in a wide variety of government uh, types of facilities. Uh, and not only does it make sense, but it is commonly used in all of those types of facilities. Um, so I mentioned office space before, uh, so both open and closed. Um, office environments uh, are common applications for masking. Uh, call centers are another uh, frequently used area where masking is employed to improve the acoustical conditions. Uh, but beyond that, getting into healthcare environments, so that could be, again, waiting areas, uh, hospital patient rooms, uh, getting into uh, clinics and doctor's offices, um, and obviously uh, beyond the normal uh, need for uh, speech privacy and, and just a productive working environment, we also get into uh, government and military type of applications where speech security is an issue. So sound masking can be used in uh, what are known as SCIF facilities, uh, which are highly uh, sensitive, isolated uh, rooms in embassies and other uh, high, highly secure areas. Mm. Uh, and in fact, uh, some governments have even gone to the step of uh, making sound masking a standard part of their office design. So the Canadian government just in the last year or two has made it uh, a mandatory element of all open office designs. And uh, what are some acoustical challenges in green buildings? Green buildings uh, have actually faced a number of uh, acoustical challenges uh, as a function of a lot of the common uh, uh, design strategies that are used to achieve some of the uh, greenness, if you can say, of those spaces. Um, and the unfortunate thing is that while a lot of those strategies have uh, benefits in one area, they tend to have unintended negative consequences on acoustics. Uh, so one of the issues is that green spaces tend to have very open uh, design standards. They eliminate walls, they reduce the partitions and barriers between people, and this is often done to help uh, improve light transmission into the space to reduce material usage. Uh, but the unintended consequence is that you eliminate all of the barriers, the acoustical barriers that are between people and, and sound, therefore travels far more easily uh, from one place to the next. Um, one good strategy to use uh, if you want to lower partitions, let's say an open plan to allow for daylighting, is to put an acoustical panel uh, partition system in up to about four foot height and then top that with glass. So you get some acoustical isolation, but you still allow the daylight to penetrate. Um, also, uh, a lot of acoustical, uh, acoustical design of green spaces uh, eliminate absorption from the space by removing the acoustical ceiling tile. Uh, and that has a negative impact uh, because, of course, it increases the sound levels in the space, re increases reverberation, and creates a, a more uncomfortable uh, type of environment. And finally, uh, one of the top green strategies is to employ uh, passive heating and cooling. And these systems, unlike forced air uh, mechanical systems, create very little ambient sound to begin with. So you take, uh, let's say, a commercial office space that already has uh, low background sound levels that make that uh, even worse in a sense so that you, know, you can literally hear pin drop from uh, quite a distance away. 
And uh, does speech privacy and noise control help improve workers and people's privacy and productivity? Uh, absolutely. And both of those issues are uh, incredibly important to people that are working in those uh, working environments. Uh, noise uh, and the distractions caused uh, by noises around people is the most frequently cited uh, uh, concern or irritant uh, in most of the surveys that are done of occupants in these types of uh, spaces. And there's been so much uh, emphasis in the last few years on uh, creating collaborative working environments where people are, uh, you know, uh, in constant sort of communication with each other and, and uh, 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 dealing with ad hoc uh, conversations. Um, that we forget that a large percentage of what people do is still heads down individual focus work. Uh, and in fact, in 2012, uh, Gensler, who's the large multinational architectural firm, did a survey of 90,000 people in 155 different companies. Uh, and they found that the strategically most important work uh, that uh, all these employees identified was individual focus work. Uh, mm -hmm. And that they spent the majority of their time uh, 55 percent uh, doing that type of, of work. And so it's really vitally important that we de design spaces uh, to deal with the issues of, of distraction and, and giving people a productive environment where they can, can focus on what it is that they're uh, doing. Indeed. Uh, and Nicholas Moeller, do you have any advice for government facility managers on, on how to specify sound masking? Yeah, it's an excellent question, and, and it's really uh, vitally important that you do uh, consider the specifications for a system when you're looking to procure one. There is all manner of ways of engineering uh, a speaker system to introduce a background sound into the space, but uh, what many people don't know because they're not that familiar with this technology is that uh, the level of performance difference between those different uh, design strategies is huge. Um, and in fact, what we're learning more and more as we uh, research uh, this type of uh, topic, you can actually have up to a 50% reduction in the performance of the masking uh, just by having what is the accepted uh, variabilities in uh, masking performance. And so uh, there are several key factors that people need to, uh, to consider uh, when they're specifying. And the first one is adjustment zone size. Uh, traditional uh, centralized types of sound masking systems from 40 years ago would have literally hundreds of speakers all connected to a single set of output controls that would cover an entire large area. And the problem with that was that you couldn't get uh, consistent output uh, throughout. So the settings would be the same, but the space interacts with the masking sound and prevents you from getting uh, uniform results uh, everywhere. The uh, second thing is to ensure that within each of these adjustment zones, uh, you have precise control over both volume and the frequencies. Uh, and so volume controls should be uh, in precise increments uh, as small as half a decibel. Uh, the frequency adjustments should uh, give third octave equalization over the entire range of frequencies that are within the masking sound. Uh, and again, you should be able to do that independently in each one of these little zones so that you can achieve uh, the specified masking curve in each environment. And then finally, the only um, real way to achieve this type of thing uh, or this type of control is to have easily accessible controls. Uh, and network sound masking systems, uh, which our company actually uh, introduced back in 2003, give you the ability to remotely adjust uh, all of these local uh, zone settings from down below the ceiling via a uh, laptop or a tablet. Um, and that, again, gives you the, the efficiency of control that allows you to actually set things up precisely in, in each area. And then the final thing to really consider is that you have to make sure that the system is actually adjusted. So you can put the best equipment in the world uh, into the space, but if it's not commissioned properly, it's still not going to provide uh, the right amount of masking. And so uh, properly specifying a, a testing method uh, and reporting of the results uh, is going to be critical to, uh, to all of your government clients. Indeed. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Nicholas Moeller, for providing this useful information to the Government Product News audience. And 
look for this on our Government Product News website very soon. And again, thanks for your time, Nicholas Moeller. Thank you very much, Mike.